All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, webinar. My name is Charles Nyabeze, and I'm the Vice President of Business Development and Commercialization with the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation. And it is with great pleasure and excitement that I would like to introduce you to um, Brian with uh, Precision Periodic. Uh, and Brian and Joellen are going to be co-presenters. I guess they'll maybe tag Tim the questions and the presentation at some point. Uh, but our presentation today is on a clean mi mining, uh, a clean metal processing technology that is really in my, in my eyes, you know, being in the technology industry and the innovation industry for such a long time is truly a, a, a game changer. Uh, so their company, Precision Periodic, is a nanotechnology company. Now, just in terms of some uh, housekeeping rules, I would like to ask anybody who has questions to please type them in the chat box. And those questions will be answered during the last 10 minutes of the presentation. So please kindly type in your questions. We will be muting everybody on the call except the presenters. Uh, so you won't be able to ask, ask your questions uh, through, through your voice. You will certainly be able to just type them in the chat box and we can go from there. All right, so without um, any further ado, I'd like to turn over the floor to, to Brian. Brian, please go ahead. Hi, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we're down here in Orlando, Florida. So it's nice and sunny where we are, it's 85, 90 outside. Um, so we're getting into our winter. Uh, so what I want to cover today is uh, some quick applications for our technology and then describe the technology and then go into um, some of the details around how it can be used. So as you can see, we like to consider ourselves a clean um, mining process. Uh, so our goal is to try to uh, minimize the amount of waste and maximize the amount of productivity from any sort of mining and or cleanup scenario. Uh, we use nanotechnology to help us do that. So some of the, uh, let me get this slide working here. Some of the examples we're gonna talk about today is the classic mining uh, where we fit in the process. So you, you dig up your ore, you crush it, you leach it. We then extract out um, the minerals of interest uh, in a clean way. Um, gold, copper, nickel, all the classic stuff one has to mine, uh, and then uh, be able to produce that out of that process in a pure form. So instead of having to use complex precipitation, complex um, iron exchange or solvent extraction techniques to pull out your uh, metals of interest, uh, this one filter structure will allow you to do uh, the extraction and then also give it back to you in a pure form separate from, for example, gold from copper, copper and silver, and give you these outputs in a good way. I also show you some acid mine drainage applications where we're pulling out pollutants out of water um, and other stuff, more uh, neutral to slightly acidic. Toxic tailings, we're talking about some arsenic, uh, uranium, manganese. Uh, we also have a, a, a job we're doing with uh, mercury. And then the last thing we'll cover a little bit is some um, direct lithium from brine, more as an example to show you what the filter technology is capable of doing. So to start with, uh, the filter technology is designed to be uh, easy to use. It's designed to allow you to free flow the liquid through it. So no back pressure, uh, no temperature, no heat or anything like that. You pour your liquid through and then we can then um, oh, wow. handle what you're interested in very quickly without having to prepare the liquid too much. So don't change the pH. If it's got some solids in it that aren't too big, that won't clog up the filter or anything like that. So our whole goal with this filter is so that when you produce a leach liquor, is that you can then extract what you want from it without adding any chemicals to it. No precipitation, no carbon and leach. You don't add anything to your liquor. If you can do that, and we just pull out what you're interested in, you then you can probably reuse it to leach some more stuff, which again, lowers the amount of waste that the process uh, generates. If you can reuse your leach liquor many times over, one of the gold examples will show, uh, we're reusing the leach liquor up to 50 cycles uh, before we have to do anything to it. Um, the same comes for the release liquids. When you're getting your material out of the filter, we wanna make sure that uh, we can reuse that liquor uh, many times over. So again, minimizing any sort of waste. Um, and so this reusability is sort of an important piece of uh, how this uh, filter works. The nanotechnology, we start, uh, if you're familiar with ion exchange technologies, they use a styrene, a lot of them use a styrene type uh, resin base to put their uh, different things on. Uh, we don't, we actually build um, 
a substrate from scratch. Uh, we manufacture ourselves where we build up a, uh, I like to use the word a wiffle ball of a nanostructure, which has astounding surface area. The way this filter works is that to pull out every atom of interest from a, a liquor or a PLF or water, we have to touch every atom of that water. To do that, we have to have huge square, a uh, huge surface area so that we can let the water run over the beads or over the surface area um, where we touch every atom. So a sugar cube size, one cubic, uh, cent, uh, cubic gram of our material is 500 square meters of surface area. So it's a very, very, very large surface area for a very small uh, device. So in the case of this filter we're showing here, we consider this our base unit. It's uh, 20 kilograms of our filter material. It'll hold up to about three kilograms of metal of interest. So three kilograms of gold, silver and gold, copper, manganese, whatever it is we're extracting from the liquor. Um, and the um, surface area is actually, I'm sorry, the physical area is actually quite small. So a plant that handles say 350, uh, 350 gallons a minute, for example, uh, would only be the size of a small container. So again, the scale of this is remarkably small, but the performance is uh, very high. How does it work? So basically the theory here, or the way it works is your liquor comes into the filter at full flow, uh, it washes over the filter. You can use gravity, for example, in our uh, uh, acid mine drainage, gravity fine. So you run over the beads. After the beads begin to fill up, you stop the flow. And then you release the metals that it's held with individual selective releasing agents. So in the case of the gold uh, situation, you would release, say, the mercury first, and then the gold second, or the arsenic first and the gold second, giving you uh, pure gold chloride, in the case of using chlorides, and pure uh, arsenic chloride. And so this process is very fast. So the absorption um, kinetics and the desorption kinetics are in minutes, not, not hours or days or weeks. So uh, it's actually quite uh, amazing to watch how fast it is. And the beauty of speed is that your work in progress can be very small. So if you're producing, if you're processing a thousand tons an hour of ore, you're only storing 30 minutes of the PLS before you can reuse it. All your tanks and everything you've got are much smaller and much more cost effective. And of course, you're not producing millions of gallons of waste. So that's the basic theory, uh, the basic action of the way this uh, filter works. And that gives you uh, a very simple uh, process flow. Here's an example of gold. This is a, a, a process we have a contract for. In this case, we're cleaning up arsenic is the main thing, but a lot of the arsenic is in um, py uh, arsenial pyrite left over from 100 years ago mining in parts of America and Canada, uh, where it was unprocessed gold ore. So it still has you know, eight to 10 parts per million gold, which is very profitable, um, but it has the arsenic, which is leaching into the ground every time it rains. Um, we have the same problem with mercury overseas. We have a mercury contract. We're pulling mercury out of uh, tailing um, and also gold. But in this case, we use a, a very old technology. We just grabbed uh, a chlorination technique from the Victorians, 1890s. And now this is where we're a little different. Because our filter can pull out just what you want, you can actually use a non-specific leach. You don't need to be precise with the leaching anymore. So a chlorination leach, in this case, it's hypochlorous, uh, HOCl, highly oxidative, pH of four, ORP of about 1,000. It leaches the gold and mercury or arsenic. Uh, in about three to four minutes, you run that through the filter, another four to five minutes, maybe 15 at most. You then cycle the filter, in five minutes, you've got gold. So the whole loop time of this is 30 minutes. And the particular system overseas, we're gonna run about 1,000 ounces of gold a day. Uh, and it's the size of two containers. As opposed to across the road, there's a classic cyanide plant, which is about three city blocks and has a retention time of several weeks. Uh, and we do that with no ponds, no wasted liquor, and we actually start the process and run it with seawater. We don't even uh, need pure water to run it. And then we recycle the water using another filter and um, good old desalination using the sun. So very fast very efficient and you produce, in this case, pure gold chloride. But the leaching technology is not unique to us. The filter beads allow us, or any of your hydrometallurgists out there, it allows you to select a more appropriate 
uh, leachant to get uh, the results you want without having to use a pollutant. For example, we have some folks looking at bromide or iodine, uh, we can use sulfuric, we can use uh, HCl, um, or whatever is necessary to get your metals liberated from the ore. Uh, and then from then on, we basically just take out the uh, metals of interest. Um, let's get on. Another way to use this, the description I've given you so far is where we have a filter program to explicitly pull out gold, for example, and mercury. But we can also program the filter to not pull something out. In this case here, the leach solution is a very, very uh, strong uh, nickel sulfate. And in this case, it's polluted by copper and also by gold. And so they want a, um, a class one nickel. So rather than process the nickel, extract it from the, the PLS, we extract the pollutant from the PLS. So the PLS comes into the filter system, comes out the bottom of the filter system in, in minutes, and then we pull out the gold and copper, giving you a class one nickel and also two other marketable products in the form of copper and gold. And so in one cleanup process, we produce uh, three marketable products. Clearly the nickel is the most value in this case because it's huge, but the gold and copper add to the, uh, add to the income. We have a lot of toxic mine waste. So processes, for example, this one is where the output after a significant number of solvent extraction uh, circuits uh, have extracted all the values they could, in this case, uranium and copper, um, and they can't get any more out, and so they dump uh, some pretty evil stuff out of their ponds. In this case, we'll just run the uh, output, the effluent coming out of the big plant through the filter and extract out of it to make a clean effluent, uh, the uranium, copper, and cobalt to uh, make the water pure, but more importantly, it generates, it should generate, once we get it up and running, about $70 million worth of revenue for an operational cost of about $15 million. And so it turns your waste into a profit center, which is pretty exciting. And this is true for um, the tailings uh, we've looked at from acid mine drainage. Um, when you go look at a, a tailings problem in America, you usually find it's uh, leaching from a huge pile of something left there. And in America, for example, gold mines, a lot of the piles the waste, the tailings, the sulfide-based ores because they're difficult to handle. Um, and with this process, you can go in and process the sulfide ores, keep the gold, take away the sulfur, uh, and end up with uh, out a acid mine drainage problem after you started by doing the water first, um, and then sort of back into where the problem really is, and, and then go through the pile so they no longer leach the uh, problematic material like arsenic, copper, um, sulfur, for example, in the case of uh, acid mine drainage. We also do uh, lithium. Um, this one is a cascade approach where you have a filter that is uh, very, very, um, it likes the filter. Uh, so the lithium is uh, attracted to the filter more than the salt or the calcium chlorides are. And so the end result is you end up with a filter that absorbs the chlorine, sorry, the uh, lithium chloride and the salt and the calcium chloride, but the lithium chloride overpowers the salt and the calcium. So you always catch all the lithium and then you cascade that down the chain where you keep dropping the salt chloride and the sodium chloride and the um, calcium chloride uh, until you have no more left and you're just left with the lithium chloride. So this approach is a little bit different than the examples I gave earlier. And the end result is though you end up with a very low energy very effective direct lithium extraction without having, having to add any chemicals. In this case, we're releasing the filter with water. And so no acids needed. And so that's quite uh, a good process to use. Again, it comes down to your competing elements. In this case, the salt is 200,000 or 110,000 parts per million, and the lithium is only 400 parts per million. So you're going to get salt whether you like it or not. So it's a case of just optimizing the filter to prefer the lithium and then cascade it. And each cascade is a smaller set of filters. And by the end, you've got rid of all your salt, leaving just your lithium. And so this is, uh, we're currently working on this with a couple of overseas companies, uh, one in Europe and one in South America. The impact is remarkable on, of course, the lithium business. Uh, gone are the big ponds and everything to do with it. 
um, you basically have a, a wellhead, a couple of filters in a small building, and then you put the water back down into the ground and that's it. So your capex is hugely reduced, uh, but your opex is also reduced if you're only using water as the active ingredient to wash out your lithium, as opposed to uh, thousands of tons of uh, precipitant uh, uh, chemistry, which is used today. Uh, all of our results are third party tested. Uh, we don't trust anything ourselves. We do everything with actual ores, all our testing so far, all our work so far is always done with real ores. Uh, we ship them off to the um, appropriate labs to test uh, and we get all our results back. Uh, we've been doing this for about six years. We've been doing it with uh, some government grants and several other projects. Um, and we're now going into the field with um, gold, and uh, lithium and uh, what was the other two different golds an acid mine drainage and then a lithium mine so uh, we'll be in service hopefully early next year we should have been in service this year however COVID came along so that was very uh, frustrating so some of the things we can extract uh, everything I've described is the same substrate it's the same wiffle ball as the nanostructure uh, it allows us though to attach about, we have 3.5 million different things we can attach to that structure. Um, and we can literally build a filter to extract or ignore to an atomic level, any one of these things. The ones in green we have done and have filters that work with that, or the entire Re family, as you see, for uranium, we started with that. Um, the gold is, uh, the gold here in the middle of the table. That is uh, a filter where we are very, we're not too precise about what we uh, absorb. So it's not a particularly precise filter for adsorption. So it gets gold, it gets uh, silver, palladium, platinum, uh, cadmium, zinc, copper, and nickel, but it won't get iron. We've actually made it so it won't absorb iron at all. And so that particular filter becomes powerful when we release it, because we can release the gold specifically to give you pure gold, 99.9 .9 gold chloride out of it, and silver chloride and these other materials. So a fairly general specific for adsorption, but a very particular desorption. Uh, so that works well. The lithium filter we've built is up here in the lithium, magnesium, calcium, potassium area. And again, that's a general adsorption, but a very specific desorption. Um, in the re, we've done a very specific adsorption, so it'll only do the re clusters, won't do much else, um, and then releases them in a bulk form. So it's a bulk extraction and a bulk release. And then we have a different filter which will absorb the bulk release and then separate your neodymium from your praseo. We've already done that. Um, and then your heavies from your lights. So you'll be able to process your re and break it out into individual um, uh, elements. Now, one of the things we like to do is stay on the same species. If we leach with a chloride, we get a chloride uh, metal. We want to give that out so there's no translation of species in the filter. So if you're leaching with a sulfuric acid, we'll have sulfates. If you're leaching with a nitric acid, please don't. But if you do, um, we'll give a nitrate back. Um, and so the species, not changing the species and doing your extraction, directly from your liquor based on that species gives you the cleanest mining and of course the lowest cost mining. Uh, and we also get very good separation capabilities if we understand the species of what we're trying to do. Uh, of course, some elements, you know, they have several different types of species in a given PLS, uh, but generally we've had good results from that. In the case of the acid mine drainage, for example, copper tends to sit as an iron in neutral water um, and our precious metal filter, this one here, will actually capture that quite nicely, even though it's not a chloride, it's just copper iron. Um, but if you've got a sulfate, uh, a sulfuric acid, acid mine drainage issue, uh, we can also capture copper sulfate. So all in all, um, the way we like to work is understand your liquor, understand what you want out of it, what you don't want out of it, uh, and then we can optimize the filter to suit that uh, opportunity. We have a few standard filters we've already built, the ones I've talked about, um, and they have a fairly decent performance. For example, the gold filter will pull out 85 to 90% of gold in a single pass on one filter. Uh, and it does that in a couple of seconds, very fast kinetics, and the release is literally within a minute. 
Um, so it uh, performs extremely well. Um, so what we're looking to do is work with different minds that have unique issues um, and an open mind to say, okay, what can we do to uh, minimize the need for ponds or um, precipitation chemistry? I mean, that's one of the biggest pollutants on the planet. If you've got a big precipitation technique for getting out what you want, you end up with large amounts of chemistry that you don't want that you have to do something with. Um, and so having this filter on board gives you a good way to design a, a full flow system uh, that doesn't need those sort of inputs, uh, therefore it makes for a fast, cost effective, cheap and very low pollutant mining system. Okay, and that's pretty much it. All right, thank you so much, um, Brian, for the presentation. I mean, just maybe just to cap off some benefits that I, I saw right away, you know, big ponds gone, you know, reduced capex, you know, a clean mining solution, low cost mining, you know, and I think the whole idea of being able to turn waste into a profit center, I mean, that's just, just amazing. Um, one of the questions I have here, Brian, and it came to me through the private chat was obviously the question about your slides, you know, just, just, just get it out there. Are, are the slides going to be made available to, to people that are, have registered on this call? Maybe just give an answer to that. Yes, I believe so. Okay, very good. All right. And just move on to another question that I have here is you mentioned the, the liqueur. Um, is there a, a size in, in terms of, of, of maybe liters that you need to be able to, to prove out the technology? Like how big a sample size do you need in order to prove out the solution? Everything we've done so far from the different mines, we usually take about five liters of their PLF. Um, and then we can do uh, most of the work with that. The scalability of the nano filter is excellent. Uh -huh. So if you start with a small amount, uh, we need enough to be able to send it off to mass spec so that they can check, you know, the uh, original PLS, what, what the PLS is like after it's gone through the filter, what we've extracted, and then what we release so we can do genuine mass balances. And you want to okay. do that three or four different times. So we've found a, a five liter container is usually an excellent amount to do the work. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, we have a question here from Phil. And, and the question is, uh, can you tell me what the nano beads are made of? That's one part of the question. So what are the nano beads made of? Then the second part of the question is, do you use different chemical coatings for different elements? Um, we're not saying what they're made of at this stage. It's a proprietary structure, mainly because okay. we want to keep the intellectual property very tight. Um, and the concept of coding isn't quite right, but it's not, it's, it's a good way to think of it. Uh, we do, it's a nano construction. We build the appropriate, um, what's the right word I'm looking for? The appropriate hooks for the different elements into the structure itself. That's why this has such a huge reuse factor. Uh, these beads are very strong. You can hit them with a hammer. They aren't going to break. Um, and they live in, uh, we can run uh, pHs below a zero um, all day. You can run pure, pure uh, aqua regia, nitric and HCl through it. It's not a problem. Mm -hmm. So they're very, very strong. To do that, we can't coat. We have to physically build it in. It's sort of like um, when you build a building, you put a foundation and then you build that foundation up and it's going to be strong. If you just sit something on top of the ground, coat it with a building, it'll blow away in the first heavy wind. So the nano construction is what we do using um, um, state-of-the-art uh, medical techniques. So, uh, so uh, you know, the folks who build your aspirin, supposed to build mm -hmm. your chemistry, uh, your medicine, uh, that's the process we use. So very strong, very predictable, and very precise. That's part of why we call ourselves precision. Precision, there you go. Yeah, thank you for, for that answer, Brian. Uh, next question here is from Peter. And the question is, uh, do you think this could replace mercury used in artisanal gold mining? And uh, the mercury is the terrible pollutant for huge social consequences. This would be uh, a small scale. C could this be used for small scale application? That's uh, the first uh, overseas gold mine application is exactly that. Okay. Um, and so that's the, uh, we go to the tailings of the uh, miners. So in other words, thousands of families have done it for a long time. And they literally have several hundred thousand tons of tailings full of mercury and gold. Uh, so we go in and the gold pays for everything. Um, and then we pull out the mercury and the gold. And these machines are about two tons to five tons an hour. They fit on a 40 foot trailer. They run off yeah. a small um, three kilowatt generator because you basically got to run a couple of small pumps. Uh, and that's it. And so, yes, you can process that ore day in, day out um, and do it 
in batches. So if somebody doesn't trust you, they can run their batch through as low as you know a couple of hundred kilograms of uh, of waste. Awesome. But yes, that's exactly what the first application is. Very good. Thank you for that answer. Um, next question is from Dawson. I got this message through a private chat. And the question is, how flexible are the filters to handling changes in metallurgy as mining progresses? Um, actually, very adjustable. And so that's an advantage and a disadvantage. <laughs> very adjustable means you've got to be right on top uh, of what's going on. And that's one of the reasons for a big mine we'd like to work with the actual mine and understand what's going on on a daily basis so we can keep the filters optimized. Uh, but you basically can reprogram the filter in about three to four days. Uh, our plan is we'd actually build a series of filters with different capabilities. And you have a lot of levers you can pull on the mine, a lot of engineering levers, the flow rate, uh, the pH, um, the ORP. There's a lot of things you can adjust on your uh, PLS and your release liquors that will allow for changes in the ore, um, significant changes in the ore. Uh, one of the ones we spend a lot of time on is uh, sulfate gold ore, for example. Um, you might have a low amount of sulfate, which changes the leach liquor slightly, but as the sulfate goes up, you hit a batch of very, uh, very, very a high sulfate area um, that generates huge amounts of um, sulfuric acid. Uh, you can change the leach structure and the filter has a very um, flexible pH, so two to five. So you don't lose the opportunity, but you basically adjust the liquor to still allow the filter to fit within its curves to extract the gold. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you for that uh, answer, Brian. Uh, Brian, just to maybe roll back on another question, uh, to follow a follow-on question from, from Phil. Uh, the question is, is the construction like MOFSs in biotechnology? I think I'm not saying that right. Maybe it's MOFs in biotechnology. No, it is uh, true nanotechnology. This is not bio. This, uh, it does some bio stuff, but the actual construction is pharmaceutical, um, non-bio construction. We literally physically build the structure to have all the holes in it. Okay. All right. I, I think someone's asking what MOFS means. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if you could answer that question, Brian. Do you know what, could you tell us what MOFS means? Someone's no, I don't asking. know. <laughs> okay. All right. Maybe uh, oh, molecular, molecular organic, organic frameworks. Frameworks. <laughs> There you go. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that, Phil. All right. Uh, another yeah, so question. We, we, go ahead. Well, we construct this in a in a nano construction technique. Yeah. We don't grow it. It's another way to look at it. Okay. There you go. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, another question I have from a private chat here is, is, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that that um, each square gram is there's 500 square meters. Uh, yeah. per, per gram. Can you just maybe elaborate on all that, what that means so that the audience can understand what that looks it's, like? It's one gram of our material is about um, one cubic centimeter. That's what I said, okay. it's like a size of, um, a, a sort of, you know, the sugar lumps you can put in your coffee. So one square, one cubic centimeter um, is 500 square meters of surface area. Now the surface gotcha. area referring to is atomic surface area. So okay. basically the Thing is a very porous atomic structure and your water pours right through it. That's yeah. why you can run these filters literally with just gravity. You don't have to pump your PLS bird at all. Okay. Um, if you want a higher volume, you probably pump it. And one of the things that will limit the life of the filter, and the reason we say only 6,000 cycles, is the uh, turbulence of pumping high pressure water through these beads will physically wear them out. Uh, over time. It's not mm -hmm. the acidity or what you're trying to do. But if you've got a gravity feed, these beads will probably last a lot longer because they're not going to be, there's not going to be a, a significant amount of turbulence. And we try to design it so you don't have a lot of turbulence. You just need gotcha. all the water covering all the beads all the time. Okay. All right. Thank you for that, Brian. Uh, Brian, another question we have here is from um, a person that had missed the beginning of the presentation. And, and the question is regarding to gold operations. How do you replace cyanide since you start from a solution to feed your bead, your bead filters? How is a pregnant gold solution generated? Okay, so on that front requires us to step back. We're not experts at leaching. We're experts at the filter. What mm -hmm. we've found is that if you had a filter, unlike say carbon, um, if you have a filter that you can program to just do gold, let's just focus on gold for a moment, or maybe even silver, Silver and gold. It'll pull out silver chloride, gold chloride, silver, silver sulfate, 
whatever it is you're going to leach with. Um, what we found is if you go to the dirt now and leach the dirt, not with a specific leach like a cyanide, but with a non-specific leach, in this case, chlorine, mm -hmm. chlor uh, um, chlorination technique, say hypochlorous. Um, so you put hypochlorous acid on the ore, the gold comes out in seconds, uh, the silver comes out in a few less, a few more seconds. You get a lot of iron. Um, you might get a lot of cobalt and copper, uh, but that's okay. That doesn't matter. You can get out uh, 100,000 parts per million iron. It doesn't really bother us. It just costs you chemistry. So you do a very fast leach on it. Separate your dirt from your leach really quickly for five minutes for a filter press. Uh, now you've got a chlorinated liquor. It's very cheap. Uh, and then you pull out your gold and silver in one process. And then because all we've done is pulled the gold and silver out of the leaching, you can put it back in the dirt for the next cycle and you keep doing that. Now, the thing about using hypochlorous um, and a salty uh, leach liquor is you generate salt. Sodium chloride begins to build up as well. If you get too much sodium chloride in your leach liquor, you can't use it anymore. So that's after about 50 cycles. And so the example that we've done and what we're doing, for example, the artisanal mine, as well as a full gold mine, is that um, 10,000 uh, liters, sorry, 10,000 liters of liquor will pre actually leach, I'm trying to get the numbers right here, 500 tons of ore hmm. from 10,000 gallons of liquor that you just keep reusing. And so that way you get out all the metals at once, which is what, not what you want to do as a normal leach. A normal leach expert on gold today, you, you try to find a very specific leachant to only pull out what you want because your filtering, your extraction from the leachant is not specific enough. We're very okay. specific. And so the result is um, um, you get uh, the gold out real good. Gotcha, gotcha, Brian. Brian, you know, we are running late, uh, out of time here, so just maybe squeeze in one last question. And the last question here is really on, uh, on uh, TSS. Any specs on feed total suspended solids? Uh, so uh, say that again, I missed the question. Uh, a, a, any specs on feed total suspended solids? I'm not sure what the first word is, but suspended solids we've been running yes. uh, uh, 75 microns or small is fine, uh, up to 12% okay. we've actually done. But the um, gap in the beads is quite large. These beads are two me uh, two, about two millimeters size. Um, and we run a long, relatively tall, uh, not too wide a column. So you've got plenty of time for the water to touch the beads as they go through. Okay. Um, and so suspended solid, also solids are not a big issue with that. Uh, okay. And we aren't polluted by extremely high concentrations of other materials, like literally 100,000, 200,000 parts per million salt doesn't upset a three or, you know, a 0.1 part per million gold extraction. That's fine. The, the specificity of the filter, we can tell it to get 0.3 parts per million gold, actually one part per billion, you know, in, in a liquor that is like basically rusty water or salty okay. water or both. Okay, gotcha. All right, Brian, thank you so much for, 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 the, for the presentation. Uh, I want to thank our audience for coming online. And uh, what we will do is we will send you all uh, a copy of the presentation and, and a link to rewatch this recording if you want to watch it. Uh, we'll also provide you information on how to contact Brian and how to contact Sammy uh, for follow-up. So again, Brian, thank you for, for the presentation. And uh, to our audience, thank you very much. And we will sign off now. Thank you, everybody, for coming on the call. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye.